Hi, this is Carlos Andres Gomez. I am coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. And I'm a poet originally from New York. I'm Colombian American. And this first poem I wanna do for you is actually a love letter to my 15 year old self. And a lot of my work is thinking about earlier versions of myself. And this is me hoping to talk to, maybe put an arm around my 15 year old self out dancing when he was 15. And this is called Last Sundays at Bootleggers. My entire wardrobe was Canal Street original. Knock off chic, adolescent sleek in my double XL blue and black bubble jacket. Yeah, I was inside the club and what? Inside an oversized coat coated in sweat and old spice. A kid eyeing 16 but not quite there. I wanted it all, Chico. Learner's permits. The latest Jordans in baby blue. Maybe a wink from the pretty Boricua in social study. And when Biggie's verse dropped in Only You, he was in that room and teaching us how to live elevated. From that third floor wasteland towering above India Point. So we sang sour-throated and nostalgic for times we hadn't yet lived in unison, like we wrote it, till our voices cracked and spilled over and between every rift, but in the throng of lost kids where I finally found a self I loved, it all came together, like we could remix any wreckage and make it into a stage to slay, so we swayed and grinded like our lives were a music video tribute, hip to hip. I don't know what your relationship is to poetry, but I will tell you this. I did not like poetry until I was 17 years old. So I hope you have a chance to sit back and just enjoy this and soak it up wherever you are in your feelings about poetry and writing. It took me a while to get there. So if you're like me, just, just hold on a second. And I'm going to do some poems, many of which are stories from my life and experiences I've had. There's so many different ways to do a poem. In the more traditional sense, they often think of a poem as between being a lyrical poem or a narrative poem. Many poems have both elements, okay? Some poems now have not that much of either in different ways. But the poems that I'm doing today, many are very much narrative poems, so they are stories. And I'm Colombian, and I joke, if you've known any Colombians, we love to tell stories. So much of my writing, much of my work is telling stories. And um, many of my poems are stories. Many of my poems as well are responses to things that I've experienced where I feel like I have to give a response because I keep dealing with it over and over again. And this next poem is my response to people not knowing what to do with me when they see this guy in the screen right now looking at you and they hear what my name is, which is Carlos Andres Gomez. And maybe some of you have that similar experience where people don't believe that you are who in fact you are, <laughs> whether that's your identity in terms of race or ethnicity or gender or sexuality or religion or nationality, or they don't believe what your first language was. Um, and so this is for anybody out there, if people have made you um, have to explain or demanded you explain yourself and provide receipts on who you are, when you are that, and you don't need to prove that to anyone. And, uh, this is called, Where Are You Really From? And it goes like this. The man's words to me are not offered, but flung. So, what are you? Where are you from? I say, uh, New York. But your name, your name is Carlos. I mean, where are you really from? I say, uh, <laughs> New York. 
Bueno, yo soy latino. Mi padre es colombiano. Mi madre es estadounidense. Nací en New York City. I lived in four countries, moved 12 times, went to 12 schools before I graduated high school. Is not what I would say in 12,341 years because I don't know a darn thing to anyone. What am I? What am I? A financial aid form, a vegan red velvet cupcake recipe? Jude discovers his first Latino with green eyes and suddenly appoints himself the authority on Latinidad. Like, but you totally don't look Mexican. Oh, Colombian. But like, what percentage are you? Do you speak it though? Fluently? Dance salsa well? Oh, but not both parents. You've been there, but not lived there. She weren't born there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a government questionnaire. I'm not an anecdote for your homogenous social gathering of your homogenous friends. I know everyone you hang out with looks like you has a name you are able to pronounce and or share and or sounds pulled directly from an episode of Leave it to Beaver. Here's the deal. Latin America is not just Mexico. Actually pronounced Mexico, pero whatever. Central America is not part of South America and Mexican is still not a language. The question, where are you from in our current America is a slur disguised with a question mark. A passive aggressive microaggression saying you are other. Saying you are not from here, saying you are not nor will ever be one of us, saying go back to where you came from. But I, I am from a place beyond place, a place where once you're from there, you can never leave because it exists beyond dirt and flesh, beyond your linear and limited concept of time. I am from bloodlines unkillable as water. I am the return that is only earned when absence has stretched its greedy void across a passage, as stoic and sacred as an abuela's hard-edged love. I am my black and Latina daughter's grace, chimered into the cobalt pulse of these once too often fists. I am a boy. Whether a word of English in his mouth, in a Catholic school classroom in South Florida, his son on StreamYard, 59 years later today, reading this poem for him, I am the steady ray of light unlocking my mother's teeth, tossed skyward with a laugh. What hard-earned joy looks like carved from the wreckage of a lifetime's worth of grief. You are not ready for the answers to the questions you ask. Not ready for the world these words might shake free. You could never understand what I am or where I, where so many of us are from. For those of you who can relate to that poem or that question, people do not think that you are English. People don't think that you have a right to be in England. Um, maybe you have a parent or your parents are immigrants, like my father. Um, maybe because of your name, maybe because of how you look or the way that you dress or something else. Um, I want you to know that poetry is a house that has room for all of us. Regardless of whatever you may have been taught, poetry is supposed to look like or sound like. Um, beyond all the little craft techniques and the tools and all the stylistic stuff, I want you to know that poetry can be yours. And I think when I was 17 and I fell in love with poetry, and this great poet by the name of Martin Espada came to my high school and I fell in love with poetry, I suddenly realized there was this thing that could be mine and I could embrace it and carry it with me on my own terms. And that's when poetry became a tool that helped me claim my identity in the world on my own terms. And it also became a tool for my own healing and my own growth. And that's something else that I hope you hear in these poems. I'm telling stories or I'm sharing tidbits from my life, but I hope that you're also hearing too in these poems. The art is an extension of my own work inside of me as Carlos. This is your buddy Carlos inside here, inside of my heart. And the poems are part of that work. They're extensions of that work. They're evidence of that work. So speaking of myself at 17, um, when I was 17 years old, it was a year after I got my driver's license. And uh, I one day was driving faster than I was supposed to be driving. And let me be clear, this is not something I celebrate. Please slow down. Don't, don't drive like I did that day if you are 17 or 18. Um, I don't know what age you drive in England. I think it's 17, 18. I, I don't know. Um, but this poem is about the first time I got pulled over. 
Um, this is a story, another one about a story. And uh, this is called Above the Speed Limit. And I think that's very, very interesting about a lot of the stories that I'm, I'm sifting through in my head and I'm thinking about now as a 38-year-old father of two is as I look at myself at 17 in this poem that you're about to hear or at 15, the first poem I read, Out Dancing, is I can't ever look at myself at 17 and not think about my children in, and the world they live in and think about them when they're 17 or they're 15 out dancing. And uh, yeah, this piece is called Above the Speed Limit. It's a, uh, it's a true story. And it goes like this. The first time I got pulled over, I turned to the classical station, rested shaking hands on the steering wheel, elevated my voice an octave, and made sure to blink wide and scared so he could see the white of my eyes and emerald irises in the late May sun. He didn't ask my name, never saw license or registration, said just, Take it easy. So I did. So I do. But my son, now 15 years and three months from his first driver's test, is black. What will he do? How much of my stare and smart mouth are imprinted? How will he understand why I can't sleep each night he's away from home and I look just like the men who too easily mistake the dark silhouette of his wallet for a gun? A lot of the stories in my poems and a lot of my work is not just thinking through the facts of what I experienced, um, but also to think about all the different ways that I might have been a part of things that maybe I didn't really, in my mind, consciously want to be a part of, or thinking about the different ways that I'm just not a hero. Um, I think that's a really hard thing to start to think about and think through when you're writing. I know when I was younger, I was the hero in every poem, in every story. And what I would offer or encourage in writing your own stories is to maybe think or consider like maybe I'm not the hero. And I know for me, when I'm trying to, I guess, look at things that are really hard to think about or really scary or really vulnerable, which is often where I'm drawn to write, um, I'm trying to look at who I am now and who I've been and think, wow, um, there were some things I need to think about and I need to, I need to look at and analyze and feel in my body and ask myself, were you the version of yourself you really wanted to be? And so it's not just telling a story just to tell a story, or it's not telling a story just to like celebrate who I was in the story. It's also look at the stories where it's where it's hard and where maybe maybe I wasn't who I, I should have been or I wanted to be. And um, this story is is at the sort of at the center of a lot of my writing that I've done over a long time, which is thinking about masculinity. And I don't know how much you've thought about or learned about masculinity. Um, but I know for me, I grew up in a culture where people told me I was a boy, I was a guy, and there were certain expectations that I was told over and over again. Like people would just tell me or they would, you know, sort of imply 
or by telling me I couldn't do or feel certain things or be certain things, they would tell me what I was expected to be. And I don't know if you can relate to that. This could be not just about masculinity. This could be about a, a lot of different identities, and different things. Um, but I know for me, I was born, I grew up, people said, you're a boy, you're a guy. We expect this. And in the culture that I grew up in, which may be similar or different to the culture that you grew up in, um, overwhelmingly people told me, you are not expected to show emotion. And not only are you not expected to show emotion, you're not really allowed to acknowledge that you have emotions. Um, you're expected to be tough. You're expected to be ready to fight. Um, you're not expected to be tender or nurturing or ask for help um, or ever acknowledge that you're vulnerable. Um, and there were a lot of other pieces of this as well, but I know in the, in the way that I grew up, it was, uh, it was a really good recipe for a very, very unhealthy life and a very sad, um, emotionally closed life without a lot of love in it. And I remember when I entered my teenage years, by the time I was 17, 16, it became very clear to me that that was the life that was in front of me if I followed these expectations. Because every person is different, but I'll just say for me, the person that I've now come to love and know very well, all those expectations were the opposite of the person I genuinely was. So you, you just met me now. And maybe you see little pieces of who I am in my poems, hopefully. But I'm a, I'm a very sensitive person. I'm a very emotional person. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm a father of two. I am a very tender and nurturing person. Um, to me, being able to not just acknowledge, but understand and talk about what I'm feeling and my emotions is one of the most vital skills for me to be resilient and adaptable and to be a good partner to my wife. And a, it's, it's essential to being a good father to my kids, to being a good friend, um, to being a good teacher. So what I found was the opposite of these expectations that I was, I was told I had to embody were in fact the things that I had to embrace to live a meaningful, loving, um, I think, life that I can call my own and on my own terms. So, so I guess I want to just offer that to you. It doesn't have to be about masculinity. If that's relevant for you, think about it in that way. But whatever expectations you feel, I want you to feel permission, whether you are watching this when you're 11 or you're 13 or you're 18. Um, I hope you feel permission and you feel supported by at least one person in your life to question the ways that people say you have to be this version of yourself. I hope that you can find space and support to be the most genuine version of yourself. And I know poetry was a really important part of me finding permission to embrace who I was. Um, and, and all of who you are, um, whatever that means to you. Um, so one big, really big piece of that for me was, was questioning a lot of the the things I was asked to do or required, I put that in big quotes, required to do as a guy. And I remember being in college and there was uh, there were certain things that you were expected to do socially. And one thing for me was, was you know, when you, when you greet or say goodbye to another guy, the expectation was um, in the Northeast United States, we call it like a DAP. I don't know what it's called in England where you are, but it's like um, you give, you give, a, give a, a DAP or a pounds, you kind of pull someone part way close to you, you, you tap them on the, on the shoulder. You're like, all right, bro, peace, bam. And then you let him go. But you're not supposed to get closer than this, than this part of your arm right here. Let me get in the frame. You're not supposed to get closer than this part of your arm. It's kind of like you got to keep that little distance, you know? And I thought that was kind of a metaphor. It was kind of a symbol for this distance that we learn um, to maintain between guys. And so I wrote this poem about what happened when I broke what I thought was a very silly social rule. That didn't make any sense to me and I didn't like. And so I walked around my college campus, my university campus, and you say uni in, in England, uh, for one hour and I held hands like this, fingers interlinked like this with one of my guy friends in West Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania on Locust Walk. And this is the true story about what, what transpired in that hour. 
as I held hands with my friend Gino and how the world around us shifted with just that one small detail. True story it goes like this. I'm holding my friend Gino's hand and asking the army recruiter for more information. About the Marines, please, I say. He fidgets with his cufflinks, paws at his necklace through his shirt, drags the back of his hand across the close-shaven sandpaper of his chin. Gino is staring him down. Through the eyeliner he wears like a middle finger, we watch this stranger, caught between the train movements of a machine and the churn butter in his body, just like mine. Two months before when I said hell no to a trip to the gay club. I just don't want to lead anyone on. It'd be like colonizing the space. I said. Which sounds a lot better than I'm uncomfortable. I wouldn't know how to stand. What do I do if a song I like comes on. In Zambia, I walk the dirt roads of a township, my pinky finger, intimately wrapped around the smallest digit of the most infamous guy on the block. He was my friend. It is how friends walk the streets there. When I greet my Iranian friend's father, we embrace cheeks twice. In Thailand, my host casually patted my leg at the first family dinner. I nearly jumped out the window, thinking he was reaching for something else. Everyone laughed, probably confused as to why this strange foreigner had been trained to be so foreign to the gentle touch of a man. A passerby gives me and Gino matching names. I tongue the word around in my mouth, feel the tender sting make a home in my torso, stare at the word brotherhood splayed across a camouflage banner. The recruiter stares down at the table, as though it holds the secret code to life's great questions. His corrected stutter and slightly overcompensating stance blend into the decorations behind him. So much so that I can barely even tell he is still there. He pretends as if we are not, begins sorting and then resorting the three lonely pamphlets dwarfed by the large rectangular table where they now sit. Boys. Seriously. Please. I'm just doing my job. His mouth begs in a voice so small and so human. It makes me feel like I've just blurted out a secret. This man has given his life to guard. Like freedom. I have one more, one final poem for you wonderful, you wonderful spirited people who are watching right now. I'm so grateful for you. I hope you found something in here that makes you feel inspired to write and not for an assignment or for homework, but for yourself, for yourself, because this can be for you and for nobody else. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I was not a fan of poetry until I was 17 years old. I learned to actually read very late. And that was a part of why I felt, I felt a lot of anxiety about even the idea of poetry. And it was something that I was so embarrassed about. I carried a lot of shame about learning to read very late. So I didn't learn to read until I was nine years old. And it was not until many years later when I was an adult in my 20s that I actually learned to not feel shame about the age that I learned to read. And uh, this final poem is, is, is dedicated to and inspired by the person who taught me to embrace that with pride, that I learned to read late. And yes, I'm a poet. And yes, I've written three books. And yes, I love words. And it's never too early or too late to fall in love with reading and writing or poetry. And it's for my little sister. Her name is Maya. And we're a huge age gap. We're 15 years apart. When she was 11 and I was 26, she found out for the first time how old I was when I learned how to read. 
And when she found this out, she had a big smile on her face. She felt loved. She felt loved, affirmed, all these things. But then she noticed the shame on my face. And I remember she confronted me about it. She was like, Carlitos, why would you be embarrassed about learning to read when you were nine years old? You're a professional writer. Your whole life is about writing. You should tell every audience that you're in front of that you didn't learn to read until you were nine years old. Because what if there's someone in that audience that wants to be a poet or a novelist or a playwright or a journalist, but thinks they can't because of how old they were when they learned how to read? And I was like, um, okay, 11-year-old. <laughs> so uh, this final piece is dedicated to, um, yeah, any of you all out there, if you ever struggled with reading and writing, if you ever struggled in school and people ever doubted you or told you you would never amount to anything, um, but you're on your path still and you're proving all those doubters and naysayers wrong, I want to dedicate this poem to you. And it's called Gifted. And it goes like this. My little sister likes to read Harry Potter books. We'll spend an entire afternoon doing nothing. But something she's not supposed to be able to do. Don't be fooled, though. By the fluttering pages in her palms, she's channeling Da Vinci. Inverting words like a fresh bruise. Turned tangerine orange, she picks the ripe hurt from a swaying branch in a chapter. And we both hear Albert Einstein's words echo up from the floor. If you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. My little sister Maya likes to read fairy tales. Has always loved fantasy. It's where we built her playground. She is Leonardo minus the mirror. Took years. For people to read what everyone thought was Da Vinci's own invented language when all he did was just write backwards. And just like Einstein and Leonardo, Maya has a gift. Some don't think so and call her dyslexic. She's a genius to her. Coded like the paragraphs, her potent mind distills. But while kids repeat monotone words from a teacher who might as well be a cartoon parrot's or a doll's audio recorded voice or a hooked on phonics tape acting as a babysitter while kids stuff their mouths with dull letters and muted sounds. Maya is in the daydream. They try to beat her down with a four-letter acronym baton, but she's too busy. Directing the orchestra with her magic wand, a symphony of mixed chlorophyll tinged pastels, constellation framed with songs of a summer breeze drenched field. Maya's dancing in an open clearing in the woods, scrawling out recipes with Mozart and sweaty rooms of overcrowded notes. She calls it a curse. I tell her it is a gift. There is nothing wrong with you, Maya. She asked me who with dyslexia has ever really done anything besides this Leonardo da Vinci or Albert Einstein. And I answer, well, I guess no one else really. I mean, besides uh, Pablo, Picasso, Anne Bancroft, John Lennon, August Rodin, Ansel Adams, F. Scott Fitzgerald, W. B. Yeats, Agatha Christie, Muhammad Ali, Maya. Your mind is a gift of greatness. I'd rather see the page like you. Imagine all of the possibilities at once, the paragraphs unhinged, each sentence released by the first hinted promise of a word. It's promise. To make us free. Thank you all so much.